This will be our 46th lesson in Ephesians. We're in the fourth chapter. We'll be in verses uh, 8 through 10. You, know, you may think that you know this already, and there's a sense in which we do. But we want to expand our perception of this, that Jesus himself is the center and the focus of the kingdom of God. Amen. Not, not us. Is Jesus. Amen. He's the head of the church. He's the head of all principality and power. He's the one through whom everything's given to men, and he's the one through whom everything's received by God from men. Amen. However, he did not obtain this ministry without duly substantiating his capability for it. He was tempted in all ways, like as we are, so he could be a faithful high priest. He was perfected by what happened to him. Now, it isn't that God had any doubts about the competency of Jesus. It wasn't that in heaven people wondered whether he'd be faithful and discharging what God gave him to do. It was for our sakes that this was done so that we might know that he's a faithful high priest. He was tested for our sakes. Amen. Not just for God to see whether he could make it or not. Yes. Yeah. Also, there's a, it's a kind of a technicality, but Jesus couldn't go back to heaven until he had duly confirmed his strength so that it could be seen yeah. <clears throat> by men. Yeah. Yeah. This is why now this transforms the need for the Gospels. Yeah. Because in the Gospels, Jesus is living out. Mm -hmm. He's defining faithfulness, mm -hmm. see, by the way he lives out. So that when it says to you, he's a merciful and faithful high priest, it means something to you. Now, I know that to a great number of professing Christians, this doesn't mean anything at all. And if they were honest, they'd tell you it did. That to tell them Christ is faithful, this doesn't have any substantive meaning to the average Christian. It's just talk. That's all it is. I know that's it because they have so much trouble living. See? So Paul's uh, is teaching with all this in mind. That it's not enough just to have the facts in the case, what Jesus did and what Jesus is doing now and just kind of have the facts all out before you because Facts don't mean anything if you don't discern them. You can spread all the facts out before a child, but <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. And you can do this to a lot of professing Christians. You can lay the facts out before them. It doesn't really mean anything. They aren't eager, a lot of them, to crucify the flesh or to deny ungodliness or to live soberly, right and godly. They've not made the connection between Christ and that. Amen. And this is a, a natural inclination. We don't deny this. That's why Paul is teaching the way he is. It's not that he sees, well, these people are really out in left field. They, they don't know what they're doing. And that isn't his, he knows how man is. Yeah. Uh -huh. That when men don't know much about God and much about Christ and much about redemption, they may be very, very sincere but that that they're still very vulnerable. Yeah. So he labors mm -hmm. 
to establish these things to the people. Now he's going to Jesus when he returns to heaven. He was invested with all power. But that doesn't make any sense if you don't see his faithfulness. See? If you don't see that he can be trusted <laughs> with all power. That he will not one time overlook the need for power and, the, and be forward to dispense it. He will not one time overlook that. Amen. And this is demonstrated like when he was on earth and some people were hungry. The disciples thought nothing of sending them away. But Jesus thought everything of sending them away. And it wasn't because they were such faithful people. <laughs> See, he never misses an opportunity. But if you don't believe that, you'll fall apart. In trial, you'll fall apart. It's not because you're a weak, snibbling sort of a person. It isn't that. It's just you don't see this clearly that he's, the Lord is a very present help in the time of trouble. See, but if you, if you can't see that, it, it doesn't mean anything. That's the reason for apostolic doctrine, to open this up so nobody, so everybody can handle the truth like, you, like you'd handle a tool. Now it's difficult for me to understand, in fact I don't want to understand why Jesus isn't being made known to church people. Yeah. This bothers me. Ministers that don't make it known bother me. I have a hard time being nice to them. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I don't want to be rude and that sort of thing either, but I got a lot of trouble with someone who says they're from God who's not doing God's work. I got a lot of trouble with this. Amen. And if you think I got trouble, you ought to see what God thinks about it. Amen. See, Paul knows this. That's why he's extending himself. I mean, I'm sure that God didn't say that, but Paul, make sure you write a letter to the Ephesians. Don't, don't forget it. Paul write a letter to the Ephesians. We get they're not stable yet. We, I'm sure this wasn't required. Paul was Paul was he was really living under God. It, this wasn't just talk. He was really doing this. See? And when you find someone who's really living under God, they don't have to be like prodded and this sort of thing. See the Lord Jesus Christ. He re we really have been made nigh to God by his blood. This is the truth. You're closer to God than you think. Amen. You've been made nigh. This is an affirmation. Been made nigh by his blood. He has, uh, he has taken Jew and Gentile and he's merged them together so they're not jealous of one another and they're not competing with one another. And he's actually produced this, this Jesus from the throne of, in heaven, his throne in heaven, has actually produced this situation where people are one spirit, have one mind and think the same way. And he's produced this. He's been proved to be a competent minister. And in Christ we've been chosen. I'm showing you the centrality of Christ here. In Christ we were chosen. In Christ we've been predestinated. And if you talk about choosing or predestinated apart from Christ, it doesn't, doesn't have any meaning for us. We were made accepted in Christ. And in Christ we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sin, he, God is determined to gather together everything in Christ. In Christ we obtain an inheritance. We were quickened together with Christ, we made to sit together with Christ in heavenly places. We were created in Christ. See, all this, so he said this in the previous chapters, of, he's, he's made this clear where Christ is. But see, if a person it's not been taught properly, and I suppose at some point all of us kind of fell into that category, not willingly, but that's, we found ourselves there. You never view scriptural assertions as assertions of truth. They're like positions, things that you should believe, you know. 
you don't see them like God intends for them to be seen. When, when God makes these proclamations about Christ, it isn't so that you will form a right doctrine or have the proper view. Or, it's so that you will be able to make this trek from earth to glory. That's why the thing is being made known. That's because that's the reality. That's right. It really is. That's right. Uh -huh. And we we are we will stand before him and be accounted for these things. That's right. If you don't see it, you can't take advantage of it. This is how the kingdom of God is like set up, if I may use that word. The kingdom of God is set up so nothing works until you see it. Now there is some background work. We understand that God works kind of in the background, but we're talking about ongoing productive learning. Now we're going to see the practical aspect of Christ's work in him being received back into heaven. This is verse 8 through 10. Now this is in view of the wherefore, is in view of the fact that to every man is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. See here, everybody in the body of Christ has been given grace by, by measure. That is grace for to do something specific. Yeah. That's by measure. Everybody is a measure mm -hmm. yeah. and has a measure mm -hmm. that is designed to profit the rest of the body. Because this is how Jesus nourishes his body, is through the various members of the body. This, this is how he does it. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Then begins a parenthetical statement. Now that he had descended, ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. <laughs> now, I glory in Paul's explanations, because that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever to the flesh. Like, what does that have to do with me? This is our flesh. <laughs> but it has everything to do. There isn't any such thing as truth that doesn't have anything to do with you. There's no such thing as that. But see, people think that there's some things that are pertinent to them and some things that aren't pertinent to them. But that's not, that's not a proper assessment at all. Wherefore, he, that God, saith. Other versions read, it is said, or the scriptures say, or the psalmist said, or the text for this I notice how some of these translations are kind of impersonal, like it's there's no life in it. Now this is the text for that. That's one of the translations. That's what it says. Now this is this is the text. Well, the psalmist said. Now he could have said there were times when he would say David said or so, but this isn't this isn't. He's talking about now who talked through David. That that's the one he's talking about now. So it's a reference to what the Lord has said and, and is written in Scripture. So I've heard people say the Scripture and the Word of God aren't the same thing. Oh, I've heard big arguments about this. Been involved in some big arguments about this. The Scriptures aren't the Word of God. They contain the Word of God. So, what's the difference? Exactly. But when the Scripture said it, see, the Holy Spirit will say God said it. That's right. Now you tell me whether you have a right to try and figure out by interpretation whether it makes any difference whether this person interprets it this way and that person interprets it the other way. If God's the one that said it, now you tell me who has a right to differentiate between what the meanings of the text. But there's a lot of this reasoning. See, this means this to you and this means this to me. And well, if God said it, he doesn't have like a, a lot of different reasons for saying it. Oh, that's, that's evidence. People do not view the scripture as true. That's yes, right. That's exactly it. It's just something for us to bounce around right. and, and vote about or, or voice our opinions about. And this then leaves the flesh more free, see? Oh, yes. Now this is 
This is my own personal objection to a plethora of translations and different versions and all this. This is my reason for it in these footnotes to say the best manuscript and all this. The reason is this all contributes to doubt. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Amen. It all lets the flesh off the hook. Mm -hmm. Amen. Maybe there's an error here. Yeah. But it took the 20th century to bring that out. Nobody, nobody in the Bible, well, there were people that said this is true, but they were unbelievers. So, and he, he just, he just states it the way it is. He saith, <laughs> when he ascended, that's when Christ ascended. Now, right away, there's very few professing Christians that have any measurable knowledge about the ascension of Christ. This is just not a subject that is spoken about. They take for granted, I mean officially it's in the official doctrine, he ascended, but he's going to make a point of this, he ascended. Other verses read, he went up. That technically is what ascended means. He went to the highest place. God's Word Bible says. He went up to the heights. The Jerusalem Bible says. He, he gone, he's gone up on high. Tyndale went, said. The Living Bible says when Christ returned. See Jesus isn't here. Mm -hmm. yeah. In body. Anymore. He ascended, just simply he ascended, reascended. Weymouth, Weymouth said he reascended, whatever that means. And he went up into the sky. That's the English re revised version. That's edified, isn't it? <laughs> He's got, whew, there he went like those people blew away by the tornado. <laughs> the Message Bible says he climbed the mountain. That's what it says. He climbed the mountain. No, he didn't climb. He, a cloud carried him. That's right. uh -huh. See, this is all fancy talk to make it plain to dumb people, you know. I don't want dumb people to understand it. I don't want unthinking people to be able to understand what God said. I want to be discontent with ignorance. Amen. I want to be the point where they say, Give me understanding so I can know your law. I want that to be good. If that doesn't happen, let the ignorant be ignorant. That's what Paul said to the Corinthians. Let him that's a prophet acknowledge the things that I speak are the commandments of the Lord. And if any man's ignorant, let him be ignorant. That's how he dealt with it. That's how we dealt with it. Some people say, that's, that's it. Just let them stay in a state of ignorance. Because those that know not God, we know what the scriptures say, say about that. Those that know not God will be destroyed when Jesus comes again. Those that know not God will be in the gospel. So all this to say, I like it when he ascended. When he ascended, he did ascend. Amen. That is, he left the earth. Yeah. The ascension of Christ is a vital part of the gospel. Jesus ascended back to heaven from whence he had come. In fact, he said one time to the multitudes, what if you see me ascend up where I was before? He ascended back where he was before. Now this, this text, he saith, he ascended up on high. This is a quotation from the 68th Psalm. And it refers to in the Psalms, it refers immediately to the Ark of the Covenant, which was the one carried back to Jerusalem, and he, he, it was gone up with a shout. God has gone up with a shout. It was at the shouting, the Ark of the Covenant was coming back where it belonged. <laughs> there was a shout. Ow. When Jesus went back where he belonged, there was a shout up on the other side. And as soon as we found out the significance of it, we joined in the shout down here. 
we're glad he went back to heaven because now that means we can go too. Yes, amen. Vital part of the gospel. It was prophesied long ago. The ascension is reported in Mark 16, 19 where it is said he was received up into heaven. So that looks at it from the other side's point of view. When they saw who that was, you know, they were glad he's back. Yes. He's back! Yes. Having accomplished the mission. Uh -huh. Well, it must have been a glad day. Amen. That must have been. It took ten days festivities to get over for the day of Pentecost. Whether we paid attention to earth again, ten days went. Little gap there. And Jesus talked about it. To the people, John 6, 62, he said, What did, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? You, you think you've seen something now? What if you have to see me go back where I was before? And some people did. Jesus referred to his ascension when he said, I go to prepare a place for you. It's the I go. That was the, asc uh -huh. it was the ascension, see? <laughs> And several times he said to his disciples, I go to my father. That was the ascension. He's, that's where he went. Hebrews 9.24 affirms, he entered into heaven itself. It was the ascension, see. Now to appear in the presence of God for us all. So the ascension postulates or is based on the fact that he'd finished his work on earth. He didn't go back till he finished what he came to do. When he said, it is finished, he didn't mean everything pertaining to salvation is finished. No, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. He's been, he's been working on this for a couple thousand years. Right. So it was that what was to be done on earth has been finished. So there isn't anything else to be done on earth mm -hmm. that is required for the salvation of men. Amen. So those that are going to come back and set up a kingdom and blah, 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 then he, if that's so, then he didn't finish the work. But he's finished the work. As far as that, there's no further reason for him to come except to wrap things up, bring it into the world, and gather the saints together and throw the tares in the fire. And that's, that's, that's it. So he's finished his work on earth. This is not ordinarily believed. There are people that are living in hopes of a messianic kingdom in the future yeah. we'll be able to go over and see Jesus in the flesh and he'll yeah. sit on a physical throne in Jerusalem and yeah. the world's going to be at peace and he'll govern the whole world yeah, was, in the body I was exhorted to make sure I got my airline tickets yeah uh, I'm mean, by a church in Texas I was visiting the man met me at the back door he said you need to make sure you get your airline we already have ours so what we'll yeah you. that's good well I have mine too <laughs> See, this is this is common stuff now it's being tossed. See, what I'm showing you is that what sounds very, very basic, uh -huh. perhaps to you now, is hardly known at all in our world. It's hardly known at all. And foreign Christians, their their knowledge of this is really at the zero level. The missionaries haven't taught the people this after all said and done and all the accolades have been sounded. This is an area of very much ignorance among foreign Christians. They just don't know this, not to mention the United States Christians. What does this mean, the work is finished? It means there's no foe that's left to be defeated. Yes, amen. He's defeated the last enemy, death. There isn't any... That's the last enemy, and Jesus defeated the last one. Mm -hmm. Death. He defeated the devil, and he spoiled principalities and powers. And what about his enemies? Well, it's just he's not right now reigning to subdue his enemies. He'll be able to do that just a just a word, mm -hmm. just a burst of glory will do that. So it means there's no enemies left to defeat. Which means if you're defeated, this is the thing you got to see here. That the thing you def that defeated you has been overcome by Christ and he rules over it right now. See, that's, that's what you've got to see. So when a person's overcome, you have to know how to deal with it. You don't say, well, I feel so sorry for you and wish you hadn't have done it. And 
give them some information about the king. Yeah. Yeah, the, the fact that you have been overcome here, that's bad. Now you confess that before God. Now let's get on so you don't have to do this again. You don't have to go through this again. Yeah. God has re regulated the kingdom of God, so to speak. He's ordered the kingdom of God, so to speak, in such a way as this doesn't have to happen anymore. The king has already defeated all the foe and everything's been made subject to him. That's why he went back to heaven. Amen. Amen. I love the truth of that. Everything requiring preparation for glory is now in place. It's in place. Everything needed is in place. The storehouse containing everything is accessible to us. That's why he went back. Yeah. He went back to administer things out of the storehouse. The storehouse has existed all along. Yeah. Yes. The, the heaven's never been without a storehouse. It's always been a storehouse. Mm -hmm. But it, it wasn't anyone qualified to dispense mm -hmm. So that's why Abraham didn't get what you have. That's why Isaac and Jacob didn't get what you have. That's why Samson didn't have what you have. It hadn't been, it couldn't have been dispensed yet yeah. as it is now. But now that he's back, duly exalted in heaven, it can be dispensed. Now heaven, Peter said in first in Acts 3.21, that heaven must is receiving Christ or retaining some version say right he's gonna he's gonna stay in heaven until everything the prophets said would come to pass comes to pass. That's Acts three twenty one. And some things the prophets said would come to pass is like the resurrection of the dead and the day of judgment. But until that time comes, Jesus is staying in heaven. And those that suppose that Jesus is going to sneak back to the vicinity of the earth, take the church out, and he's going to come back again and establish the kingdom on earth. They are missing it because Jesus is not leaving heaven till the final thing's been done. Amen. As is depicted of the high priest. When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, when he come out, the intercession was over. Amen. It was done. Yep. He didn't intercede outside, he intercede inside. When Jesus leaves heaven, no more intercession, no more people being saved in the normal sense of the word, it's all over. So he's gone into heaven, presumes everything required for salvation has been done, been completed. Having ascended into heaven, Jesus is no longer, nor will he ever again be accessed by the flesh. The world sees me no more. He's now passed out of that domain into heaven. Now it says that heaven, he ascended up on high and he led captivity captive. Well, it's, just, it's a strange expression and it's been proved very difficult for some people. Other versions read, he led a captive, he led ca captive a host of captives. This is the New American Standard. NIV says, NIV says he led captives in his train. Not choo-choo train, I mean, you understand. <laughs> it's train like what follows behind him, like a wedding a bride has a train to her garment. The New Revised Standard said he, he made captivity itself a captive. And that Bible says he captured captives. Living Bible says he returned triumphantly. International English says he captured everything. Message Bible says he captured the enemy and seized the booty. The Amplified Bible says he led a train of vanquished foes. Now what does all that mean? <clears throat> Well, some people are of the persuasion that what this means is that he he emptied out paradise and took all the souls to heaven. That sense then they would have been held captive. They were confined to paradise like Lazarus, Abraham. And then he emptied it out and took all the souls. And so there isn't a paradise anymore. But the thorn in that is, Paul says he was... He was lifted up to paradise. So, so, <laughs> so I said, if, if paradise di didn't exist anymore after Jesus went back to heaven, how could Paul be caught up to it? Yeah. Uh -huh. To paradise. 
There's no clear scriptural support of that opinion. Amen. Even though it's held by a lot of, a lot of people. In the message Bible says he took the booty, what he took from the captives, he took that and distributed it to the people. But see, that isn't true because he's going to tell you what he distributed in the next verse, and it's yeah. not booty. Yeah, that's right. So spoils, we call it spoils. Uh -huh. So David, he did distribute the spoils. That's, that is what David distributed, yeah. the spoils. But that's not what Jesus, in this text here, not what Jesus is said to have distributed. Now all of these explanations, they're an attempt to inter what I call intellectualize ignorance. The meaning is that Jesus captured what had taken men captive. In the words of Hebrews, he destroyed the devils. That's the same, just another angle looking at the same thing. Or he spoiled principalities and powers. He's looking at the same thing from another angle. Peter said, Authorities and powers were made subject to him. That's saying the same, saying the same thing a little different way. They were captivated in the sense of no longer being able to capture those who are in Christ. Or the devil can't touch him. He's in other words, the devil and all his hosts, there's always been a sense in which they were subject to God. But now in, in salvation, in the matter of salvation, all of these forces are under Christ and they got to obey him. If he says back off, they have to back off. All subject to him. When Jesus left the earth, he took away the power and effectiveness of the devil and his host. Took it with him. I don't know of any recovery ministry or ministry of that sort that deals with Christians that have dropped off the edge that actually make a point of this. That's right. That the thing that conquered you mm -hmm. has been conquered by Jesus. Yeah. And if you would have depended on Jesus, yeah. you wouldn't have done that. Yes. Amen. I think that needs to be said sometimes. Okay. That needs to be brought out to people. That uh, he took captivity captive. So it may not be captivated by you, mm -hmm. but it has been captivated by Jesus, and God's arranged the kingdom. So if you want victory, you, now you're going to have to go to Christ to get it. Amen. You're going to have to draw an eye to the high priest. You're going to have to depend on the high priest to give you the victory. Mm -hmm. If you, you can't have it, you can't have it just by sheer willpower or effort or this sort of thing. It, it'll take all your effort, but you you have to get it from Jesus. That's the way it's set up. He's the one that's captured captivity. Amen. That's a good concept, isn't yes, it? Amen. Captivity's been captured. <laughs> now, why is this so? Because this is necessary for Jesus to bring you to God, which is what He's doing. He's bringing us to God. First Peter three eighteen. For Jesus to effectively bring you to God, the opposition has to be under his feet. Or he can't do that. See, Moses couldn't do it because the opposition wasn't under his feet. But it is under Christ's feet. So if you rely on him, you really do, he'll get you to God. That's the way it is. Why? Because he's captured captivity. And then he, having done that, he gave gifts to men. Oh, well, why did he wait till he done that to give the gifts to men? Because the devil would take them from men if he hadn't done that. See, if the thing, if the king that captured hadn't been made captive, hadn't been captured, then as soon as he gave the gifts, the devil would have taken them. Yeah, that's right. So he first subordinated the foe, <laughs> then he gave the gifts. Amen. Hmm. Now that opens up to you kind of how the kingdom of God works. You want to be able to do something for God? You want to be able to have an ability to exercise it? There's some things that had to be subordinated before that can happen. You have to go forth and sin no more. You have to subdue the flesh. This is how the kingdom works now. You can't have a great aptitude to serve God and live in a state of being conquered all the time by sin. 
This, this will not work. This is why Paul didn't want John Mark to go with him. I know some people say, well, John Mark probably didn't do anything so bad. Well, did he didn't do anything so bad. He left the work. He got off the boat in the middle of the work, and that wasn't so bad. Why well, people forgot what God said about unfaithful stewards. Did they, did they forget this? So if you want to promote any sympathy for Mark, promote it after he came back, like Paul did. He came back then. There wasn't any more of this difficulty that Paul had with it. He gave gifts to men. <coughs> now the men in whom he gave the gifts were reconciled to God by him. That's the men he's talking about. The gifts pertained, as he's going to develop in his chapter, to equipping the saints. These gifts are the means, the gifts are the means whereby men become laborers together with God. Working through the Holy Spirit, these gifts will carry on the work of Jesus. See, Jesus was working. When he's on earth, he's working. The disciples thought when he left, this was going to have an adverse effect. They were sad when, they, when he said he was going away. They were sad. Oh, I can see you're sad, Jesus said, because you don't, you don't see the significance of me going away. Because if I don't go away to comfort her, he won't come. And he's obedient to comfort her. If I, don't go, if I don't go away, he won't come. But if he comes, you'll be adequate. The work of Christ was carried on after Jesus left. Now, although men are involved in these gifts, and he's going to name them in the next verse. Verse 11. Although they're named, the point is the is our, the point is the gifts, not the ones that had them. Yeah. It's the gifts, not the ones that had them. Now, you, now, unfaithful people can't have the gifts because they won't function. They won't function. They'll break the they'll break the wine skin. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you take these gifts and you give them to an unfaithful person, they'll be the means of that person's destruction. They'll break the vessel. Mm -hmm. So as I understood, these are. He's a reconciled people. They were given, the gifts were given after Jesus had ascended into glory. Now he's going to comment on this ascension a little bit. <clears throat> now that he ascended, what is it but that he first descended? What is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? See, it sounds strange, doesn't it? See, this is not church talk. You've got to be able to pick up on that right away. This is not church talk. This isn't the way preachers talk. But it is the way Paul talked. Amen. It's the way he wrote. Now that he's ascended, this expression, now, it's a point of reasoning. We might say, now in view of this, now that he's ascended. Some of the versions read, now this, like what does it mean? New King James Version, this expression. What does he ascended mean except, and then he's going to tell you what except. There's a reason why Jesus ascended. And there's something that had to take place before he ascended. There's something that had to take place. What is it that means that he ascended? Well, it means that he first descended. He first descended. When was it that Jesus descended? Well, now at this point, the translators again enter in to confuse us. The Amplified Bible says he had previously descended from the heights of heaven into the depths, the lower parts of the earth. So they're talking about, and several versions take this view, they're talking about the, not parts of the earth, no, the text says parts of the earth. And that is in the original, for those that want to search it out. It doesn't say the earth, it says parts of the earth. See, these versions say it's several commentators, several notable commentators say the lower parts of the earth refer to the earth itself. The earth is lower as compared to heaven. I'm saying no, that's not what he's saying at all. It's not referring about Jesus coming from heaven to earth. That, that introduces an illogical type situation. Because he doesn't, 
us sinned because he came down. That's not, why, that's, not, that's not his point of reason here. If he came from heaven, he's got to go back to heaven. That's not the point he's making here. The point he's making was something was accomplished by Jesus on earth before he went back. Yeah, uh -huh. That's the point he's making. Actually, it would be improper to call Jesus coming down to earth a descent. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a descent. In fact, so far as I know, every descent in Scripture, most of them at least, is a visible descent, a bodily descent. The Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. When Jesus comes again, he's going to descend from heaven. It's an observable, it just doesn't mean coming down, it means more than that. The second coming would be a descent. Not the first coming. See, he didn't come down as a fully mature person. He humbled himself and was made. Right? Is what the script says. In the likeness of sinful flesh. Seems to me that Paul is in the process of expounding the results of Christ's vicarious death. He's referring to something that's connected to the death of Christ. And that's what we want to look at. Now, he could not go back to heaven until he finished the work. That's why he prayed in the assembly, I have finished the work mm -hmm. thou gave us me to do. John 17, 4. All right, now let's look at the lower parts of the earth. That's quite a, quite a phrase. Some versions say the lower parts, that is the earth. Jew, Jew, Jewish Bible. The lower regions, namely the earth. Sinead Bible. Descended to our lowly world. It's in the Living Translation. Now, as I understand it, these are not proper translations. The earth, to begin with, is not the lowest region. We know this is the case because there's a realm called under the earth. Mentioned Philippians 2.12, Revelation 5.3 and 5.13. So, it's not the lowest region. David wrote of the lower parts of the earth, Psalm 63, 9, declaring that those who sought his soul would go there. So he used this, this very language. Yeah. Isaiah challenged the lower parts of the earth to shout and break forth in singing. That's what he said, let the lower parts of the earth shout and bring forth in singing. This apparently is a region that belongs to the earthly order and will go away when the earth is destroyed. But it's not a visible, not a visible location. Now the language is very precise. He doesn't say the lower parts, that is the earth. That's not what he says. In this regard, other versions read the lower earthly regions or depths of the earth. <clears throat> at NIV. Murdoch translates it the interior regions of the earth. And kind of intriguing. No Jerusalem Bible says the deepest levels of the earth. Now Jesus, he spoke. He spoke about this. He said the Son of Man must be in the heart of the earth. Right? <laughs> Matthew 12, 40. In other verses read the depths of the earth. See, so it is something connected with the earth, but it's not the earth. It's, it's not the earth itself. Yes. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've read that a lot, and, and like men have been confused. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm still trying to to grab my my mind around it. When are we speaking of not so much where Jesus physically went, but w what he accomplished? No, not this. He did accomplish something there, but it's where he went is where, the point here. Okay. Yeah. It's where he went. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he did do something. He did do something there. So Jesus said he would be in the heart of the earth. So this is something connected with his death. Now this I want this is the point I want to make. Whatever this wherever this region is, yeah. it's connected with his death. 
now with his life. If he went down to come down to the earth, that's connected with his life right. on earth. But this is connected with his death in some way. The descent was to the into the region of the dead. Of which we know very little, and there's not human language doesn't have a vocabulary that describes this. Older versions call it hell. Later versions use the word Hades. The word hell used to have that meaning. Uh -huh. The word hell of old time didn't mean lake of fire. Yeah. It meant this unseen abode uh -huh. of the dead. The difference in the two words is that doctrinally hell is a place of torment, everlasting torment, while Hades is a kind of a holding place. That, that's the difference between the, in the definition of the two words. And hell or the lake of fire is not associated with the earth. Because death, that's the grave, and hell, yeah, right. as Hades, are going to be cast into the lake of fire. See, so, so hell is not really connected with the earth. That's right. So it can't be connected with right. Jesus humbling himself and coming right. down. That was a place that was just created for the devil and his angels. That's right. That's right. That's right. Amen. So this was a re in, in the region of the dead. On the day of Pentecost, Peter referred to this doctrinally. He talked about what this verse is saying. He talked about doctrinally. And he spoke from this psalm. He said, therefore, it says of, of Christ's resurrection, or said more precisely, of Christ's anticipation of the resurrection. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh shall rest in hope. So this is a time when his body's in the grave, yeah. flesh rested on, yeah. and his spirit is some in this holding place, wherever it is. But Jesus is anticipating coming out of there. Amen. Amen. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. That's the Hades. He didn't. He didn't mean lake of fire. Jesus never went to the lake of fire. He okay. tasted the wrath of God on the cross, not in the lake of fire. Amen. Thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Mm -hmm. But normally happens. And Jesus was in the grave long enough, yeah. technically, for there to have been corruption. Yeah. But it didn't occur. Mm -hmm. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Now he's reasoning this out while, while he's dead. Yeah, right. He's reasoning this out. His spirit is reasoning this out. <laughs> Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. I'm coming back. Yeah, See? Yeah. So he, he declares this, that when Jesus died, during this three-day interim, he was anticipating coming, being raised. Amen. Well, I wasn't going to leave him in the region of the dead. Yeah. Although Jesus descended there, he knew he was going to not stay there. But can you imagine the impact of the region of the dead mm -hmm. on the prince of life? I mean, you have do not have the faintest idea. None of us can yeah. conceive of the prince of life being in the domain that belongs to the dead. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way you can even can imagine what that was. But Jesus, he knew. <laughs> You're not going to leave me here. Uh -huh. But he had to descend. He had to go there first before he went back. Why? Because death itself had to be defeated. Amen. Before Jesus went back to heaven, yep. death itself had to have the death blow administered to it. And the only reason, the only way that could take place is Jesus had to go to the domain where death reigns. Right. And then he had to demonstrate his power by coming back from that region. Yes, brother? It connects directly to the statement he destroyed him. He had the power of death. That's exactly it. This is how he did it. That's exactly it. He proved... Now then, this was for us. He actually destroyed the devil in his death. That's right. But to confirm this, that Satan really has been destroyed, the last stronghold the devil has is death. He has no other stronghold after this. 
and Jesus came back from that last stronghold Amen. proving that Satan had in fact been destroyed. Amen. Yes. See this, especially when they're dying. If they're That's at that right. point, That's this it. is very powerful for them to know. And if it had been anything, anything at all, that it could have held Jesus there, it would have. Could have held us there? Well, if it held Jesus yeah. there, there's no hope for us. That's, That's right. right. Amen. But it didn't. I mean, it didn't. That's right. So there is hope for us. Amen. Amen. That's why Revelation also confirms Jesus testifies that I am he that was dead. Was dead. And am alive That's forevermore. Right. And... Yeah have the keys of hell and of death. That's right. Yeah. So the fact that he rose again confirmed that he had, in yeah. fact, destroyed the devil just like the doctrine teaches. Right. He had really done this. But he didn't come back until the appointed time. Yeah. Three days, they had to be there long enough to defy any other explanation. Yeah. So the point of the text is twofold. First, Jesus entered into the region of the dead to conquer it by returning from it through his own power. And second is to establish that Jesus, that the Jesus that ascended into heaven is the same one that died. Amen. Amen. Yep. Not another one. It looked like another one, but it wasn't. It's kind of a technical explanation, but... I'm not at all satisfied with what I've given you so far on this. But you can see how that it's a different different kind of reasoning. But you can tell by the way Paul talks that this is a very critical critical factor, yeah. even though it kind of is beyond us. It's it's very difficult to comprehend. Preaching to the captives, this is quite a, uh, exhilarating when you consider it that, that if Jesus just wasn't there lying dormant. He was working. Yeah, that's right. He was doing something that's right. in this in this the, the abode of the dead here. Yeah. He's preaching. Now, what reason could there possibly be for him to preach if there could be no effects from that preaching? Yeah. Well, how could he, how could you preach in the devil's domain if he hadn't yeah. been destroyed? You get in the devil's domain today, and I'll tell you right now, if you don't know, if you don't know these things, you won't be able to preach either. Right. But he couldn't have been, he couldn't have done anything productive in the devil's domain if the devil hadn't been destroyed. Amen. And this had to be proved before he is ascended. Yes. Amen. First descended. So the Prince of Life had a significant impact on the domain of death. That's exactly right. Amen. In fact, now it says death is yours. Yes, you remember he said all things are yours. Death is one of the things that belongs uh -huh. to you. And death can't separate you. Why not? Because it's been conquered. Amen. Did you, are you afraid to die? You don't need to be. Yes. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens. Now this is a conclusion of a parenthetical statement. It's like an explanation. Now when Jesus rose from the dead, he wasn't recognizable. It looked like it was, he was different. Now he pulls the firm, he wasn't different. This is not different. But he did look different. For instance, Mary thought he was the gardener. And Cleopas and the companion, they didn't recognize him because he was in another form. They thought he was a stranger. Remember? And when Jesus appeared to the eleven, they thought they'd seen a spirit. Luke 24, 39. But here, this text affirms, no, no, no. It was the same Jesus. Same one that died. Even though it didn't look like it. Nobody recognized it. Nobody saw Jesus after his resurrection and concluded right off the bat that it was the Lord. It only was John and it was some evidence. It is the Lord. It wasn't, it wasn't his appearance. It's yeah. what he did. Yeah. See, So he appeared different, but Paul's establishing he wasn't different. This is the same one that came down. Is the same one that went back. What does that mean? It means his essential person never changed. See, or else you couldn't say this. See, there are people that have a lot of trouble with thinking of Jesus as God. They have a lot of trouble with this. But if he if he didn't change, then the same person, then whatever he was when he came down, 
he was still that when he went back. It was the same. So his tenure on earth, and I speak this for the comfort of the saints, his tenure on earth didn't change his nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that should be a great comfort to you. Now you're in Christ. Yours won't change you either. Walk in the Spirit, it won't change you. One time, you know, they said they didn't make the disciples didn't connect Jesus as being God. I don't believe they ever referred to him as God. <laughs> Back one time, Philip said, Show us the Father. He hadn't made this. God manifest in the flesh. Now, nobody said that after Pentecost. They didn't say this, you understand. Uh, that statement, by the way, was right at the end of his ministry. That's They've right. Been all that time. That's right. Jesus right. Say, Philip, haven't you? See, they hadn't made the connection between yeah. him and God. When it's revealed to him, now, Peter did confess you're the son of God. It was revealed to him. He saw that. The disciples referred to Jesus as rabbi. They called him Master. They called him Lord. Mary called him Rabboni. I don't believe you'll ever find an instance where one of the disciples called him Jesus. Say Jesus. They never, <laughs> I, think, I, don't, I don't think you'll find an incident where they ever did call him by his given name. Jesus. They never for sure called him God. They never said that. But now after he was raised from the dead. And he confronted Thomas. Mm -hmm. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Mm -hmm. Nobody had ever said that before. Uh -huh. yeah. What did that prove? He's the same one that came down. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a minor point, but I, it's just the infirmity of our understanding. It isn't a minor point at all. That Jesus came down, did not function as God. He functioned as man, but he, his essential nature still stayed the same. Great is the mystery of godliness. <laughs> yeah, God is manifest in the flesh. Seen of angels, so forth, received up into glory. That's right. Even after Jesus raised from the dead, the women came back, mm -hmm. Mary, told the disciples as they believed not. They didn't believe the one that came back was the same the one that came down. Even when the risen Christ showed himself to the disciples, he showed him his hands and his feet. Yeah. So I'm a real person. Mm -hmm. And they believed not for joy. Yeah. They were so happy they didn't occur to him this is the same one that came down. They connect, he's the same one that was among us. Mm -hmm. See? But Paul said, no, it's the same one that came down. And it's the same one that went back to earth. But Jesus that ascended was the same one that walked among men, was crucified, entered in the domain of the dead. But when he went back, he was exalted. He went up, he ascended far above all heavens. Now see this again, this is a poverty of human language. The matter of heaven is a rather complex idea. The scriptures speak about the third heaven. And it speaks about heavenly places and it speaks about the heaven of heavens and it speaks about heaven itself and you kind of get the picture else. This is not like the living room. I mean, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. It's the kind of thing that's very difficult to explain to us mortals. I gather there's a general sense in which the heaven, heaven in a general sense, is like the tabernacle. It had the outer court, the holy place, and the holiest of place. But it, the whole complex was called tabernacle. So, yeah, this is a... I consent that this is clumsy language, but it appears though heavens that way they're like different parts. There's a part where man is allowed in now, a part where he's not. 
There's a part where Jesus sits on the throne. There's a part where the throne isn't technically located. It is in heaven, but it's, high, it's higher. Mm -hmm. There are high-ranking personalities in heaven. Mm -hmm. There's the holy angels. There's a seraphim. That word is, is a plural word. Sometimes he changes seraphims and cherubims, but seraphim and cherubim are both plural words. There are seraphim, cherubim, living creatures, four beasts, 24 elders. These are heavenly creatures. They're not all like clustered around in, sitting on the throne. God and the Father and Jesus sit on the throne or some are gathered around, but and then there's a spirit, there's a heavenly places where some wrestling's done. We wrestle against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of the world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. So there's a, there's a domain, there's a heavenly place where evil spirits are, but it's not like where Jesus is. Not where the cherubim and seraphim are, see? It's a large region. It's above the earth. Jesus has been exalted, in other words, above everything and everyone that's been created. Amen. Whether it's Satan and his hosts, or whether it's a cherubim, or whether it's a seraphim and four living creatures, or whatever. anything that's been created, Jesus is way up above it. Amen. Whatever it is. Or whoever it is. That's why it can't separate you from the love of God. That's why it can't separate you. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why can't it separate? It's not because there's a law against it. It's because it's a king against it. Amen. That's right. Amen. It stands between you and those things. Amen. See, a gospel that does not accent the exaltation of Christ is not a gospel. There's an inordinate effort these days to humanize Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an unwise, uh, unwise endeavor. Amen. Now why did he ascend up far above all things? Like there's, no, like there's no competition. He's far, but no competition at all. Is that he might fill all things. Other versions say, fill the whole universe. Basic Bible says, make all things complete. Amplified Bible says, fill from the lowest to the highest. Now this is another view of God, of Jesus dispensing his fullness. Fill all things. Whatever needs to have Christ's fullness poured into it, it has to be done from a place that's above everything else. Now what would happen if people that are seeker-friendly people, what if they saw this? Would they try and adapt Christ to the lower realms? No. It's an illegal activity to try and reduce Christ down to an understandable level so people that don't have understanding will appreciate him is an unlawful endeavor yeah, because right. he has been exalted higher than everything else and it's a sin to represent him in any other way. Amen. 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 He's like you in the sense that he was tempted. His temptations weren't like your temptations, but have you ever been tempted to turn a piece, turn a stone into a piece of bread? <laughs> he was. He was. Was you ever tempted to jump off a high place, knowing the angels would carry you away? This happens. Oh, when was this? About nineteen. Uh, early 80s I was asked to speak at a high school graduation it was at a charismatic school so I told him I said now God can do anything can I hear an amen on that and boy they be an amen and you know 
said that with God all things are possible. Amen. Amen. Whosoever shall ask you anything, doubting nothing, he'll be given you. Amen. Whatever all shout. And I said, you know, with this in mind, I thought to myself, I think I'll ask God to be able to fly. Because, I mean, think of the savings, the financial savings. I did a lot of flying in those days, and I'd just be able to fly to wherever I was going, and it could be very profitable. And after all, whatsoever you ask, nothing doubting. You quoted all those texts, you know. Said so I, I decided I was going to test it out. I, I went up to the top of my roof, and got up on the edge of the roof. And I looked down there, and I said, give me faith to fly, Lord. Give me faith to fly. I know that uh, all things are possible with you and so forth. Of course, I drug it out a little bit and then bent my knees. And I said, then it came to me, well, I should be able just to take off from the ground. I don't need to jump off from the top of the house. <laughs> they all laughed. I said, see? I says, I just bombarded your entire theology. But they didn't know it. <laughs> they said, they said God could do anything, but it was just because that's just what they say. Paul is teaching this, so you will know this. You'll be able to enter into life knowing that Jesus has been exalted as head over all, and there's no such thing as you confronting something or someone that he does not have total and dominating control over. All he has to say is, that's it, and the trial's over. Wow. Just that simple. And if he doesn't say it, he'll dispense the grace to make you superior to it yeah. because he's superior to it, and he imparts Amen. that quality Amen. to you. So he that fills all things because he's superior to them. To the fact that we are present in the body and absent from the Lord, and that he's gone into heaven, as the scripture says, this by no means suggests he's not with us. That's right. Yeah. Jesus said to his disciples that when this happens, that you'll weep and you'll lament, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Yeah. And they realize he's still he's still with us. So a Christ who is not presently above all things can't be the Savior. Mm -hmm. He can't bring you to God, but of course the good news is he is. Yeah. He is above all things, and the same Jesus that is sitting at the right hand of God right now is the very same one that one time turned to the Father and said, I come to do your will, O God. It's written in the volume of the book of me. And he laid down his life, took it back up again, went back the same person that came down. Amen. Any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight? Reference that you had there to 1 Corinthians 15 about him uh, uh, ruling. He it said he yeah. reigns. Yeah, reigns. Death being the last enemy is the yeah. reference that you had. It says right before that, he says he reigns mm -hmm. until all his enemies are under his feet. Yeah. So he's reigning now. He's reigning now. No, Amen. The reason it says until all enemies is he's not reigning now to subdue his enemies. He's already successfully done that. But he's reigning to bring the saints home, and then he's going to, it's going to become evident that his enemies are his footstool. Yeah, amen. This is a, uh, an area of great deficiency in the church, is this proclamation that he's reigning now. Oh, I know. You know, this is, um, if, if, I think if this could be seen more clearly, then this other doctrine, when I'm coming back and establishing a throne, would be seen for what it is. Oh, yeah. He revised a lot of songs. Yeah. How the songs have he rewritten? <laughs> I've heard some of them say that he's reigning, mm -hmm. but then they still talk about him coming here. Oh reigning. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, there are songs that do speak about him reigning now. He is, he is. Well, there's a lot of he is king songs. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've heard some preaching that says that too. He's oh, yeah. reigning and ruling now, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yet he's yeah. coming to earth to reign and rule yeah. as well. Yeah. I guess that means more extensively. Yeah. <laughs> but you can't rule less extensively. I mean, if you have, how could you have all power in heaven and earth less extensively? Yeah.
Yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the exalted Christ, that there is, in fact, only one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same one that was with you from the beginning. He has received the glory that he had with you before the world was. We rejoice in this, and now that uh, he is able to bring us to you effectively and joyfully, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.